Okay, well, we'll get started if that's okay with everyone. Today I'm presenting on the current role of PET scan in urology oncology. I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Dan Worsley from Nuclear Medicine. Um, thanks for coming today, Dan. So the aims of the talk today is to understand the basic concept of PET scanning and review the emerging role of PET scanning for urology oncology, in particular in prostate cancer and choline, um, choline PET, renal cancer, bladder cancer, testicular cancer. And I know it's not PET scanning, but I also have a brief review of um, radium-223 because it's an interesting future development. So what is PET scan? PET scan stands for positron emission tomography. And this first uh, PET device was used in the 1950s for brain imaging. With an increase in the radioactive isotopes available, the clinical utility of PET has increased over the years. They use a tiny amount of uh, radioactive substance, which is called a radionuclide, radioactive trace, or radiopharmaceutical, and it's used to evaluate the metabolism of an organ or tissue of interest. And this provides information about the physi physiology and the anatomy of a structural organ. Previously, this was used alone, and, and more these days it's become standard to fuse this, particularly with a CT scan, and also more, um, uh, more commonly these days, an MRI. This is called co-registration. As I said, it was previously read alongside a CT and or MRI to give the anatomic information as well as that metabolic information, but now they're really integrated together and done simultaneously, essentially simultaneously. And this allows no change in patient position, and therefore the images are more precise. The most important, one of the most important parts of the radio traces or radionuclides, and which is an unstable, which is an atom with an unstable nucleus, and this is used in PET scans, uh, um, used in PET scans of substances such as glucose, carbon, and oxygen, and they normally, uh, these substances are normally utilised by a particular organ or tissue of interest during metabolism. You also have a radioactive substance which is attached to this chemical, and the most common is fluorodeoxyglucose or FDG, as we all know. And this is often used in scanning of the brain because uh, the brain uses glucose for metabolism. Some of the shortcomings of FDG are that it's taken up by macrophages and therefore can give false, reason, uh, uh, false readings. Um, it may occur in some inflammatory conditions. The trace is excreted, in particular in urology, this is a problem, it's excreted in the urine and therefore accumulates in the bladder, kidney, the prostate and around the, the renal, uh, around the pelvis, which makes it difficult for us. Cancers under investigation must be metabolically active with high glycolysis rates, and uh, this is usually low in prostate cancer. Some of the more common radiopharmaceuticals are listed there, particularly carbon-11, which is used to pair with choline, and also fluorine-18, uh, which is the most common tracer used with a half-life of about 110 minutes or almost two hours. The longer half-life of this allows it to be produced off-site, and um, previously a cyclotron which produces these uh, isotopes needed to be on site, but um, with a longer half-life it can be produced elsewhere. The shorter half-life requires on-site production and higher costs. A cyclotron is the machine that produces these isotopes and it comp is composed of two hollow, uh, hollow metal electrodes in a vacuum chamber between two poles of an electromagnet. In the centre um, at BC Cancer Agency, they use hydrogen, but you can also use deuterium. Uh, and this is a gas that's placed and yields the particles to be accelerated, either H minus or D minus. Under the strong magnet, uh, these anions gain energy from alternating voltage between the electrodes, forcing them to travel in a spiral path. And then in the perimeter, they hit a, a foil, removing the electrons from the anions and forming positive charged particles. This change in charge deflects the particles out of the accelerated into an isotope target, yielding positron emission radionuclides. This is, this is a schematic of the, uh, the cyclotron with the two magnet poles. The charged particle in a spiral path hits the foil and comes out into that isotope target. And not only do you require the cyclotron, but you also require um, specially adapted on-site chemical synthesis apparatus to produce a radiopharmaceutical uh, after radio, radio isotope preparation has been performed. Another difficulty with this is that the, the half-life during the day changes and you get decay and it requ requires frequent recalibration, recalibration during the day. And, um, and places like BC Can Cancer Agency run the cyclotron twice a day to get those isotopes 
up to date. The radiation dose is somewhere between 5 to 7 millisieverts, where a chest X-ray in comparison is 0.02, so it's quite a high radiation dose. And when combined with CT, can be up to 23 to 26, but this is probably an overestimation. It's usually more like 12 to 13. Um, and so it must be justified. How does PET work? That radio labelled isotope is given intravenously to the patient. It becomes trapped in metabolically active cells, and it does this by becoming phosphorylated by hexokinase into FDG6 phosphate, which is not metabolised further and therefore accumulates intracellularly. As the radioisotope undergoes positron emission decay, it emits a positron, an antiparticle of the electron, with opposite charge. It travels a very short distance, usually less than one millimetre, and loses kinetic energy until it decelerates to a point where it can interact with an electron. This annihilates both the electron and positron, producing a pair of annihilational gamma photons, and these are in opposite directions. These are detected when they reach the scintillator, in the scanning device, creating a burst of light which is detected by the photomultiplier tubes. And it's important that the two gamma photons are emitted almost at 180 degrees apart, and a straight line is drawn between the two simultaneous detection events, pinpointing the source in space. This schematic uh, has a patient in the detecting device where the gamma photons in the annihilation, annihilation gamma photons uh, are produced, it's detected, processed, and an image is placed on the computer. Attenuation correction is required. You can imagine um, when photons are emitted by the radio tracer inside the body, they are absorbed by intervening tissue between the detector and the emission of the photon. As a different line of response must transverse different thicknesses of tissue, the photons are attenuated differently. This results in structures deep in the body having a falsely lower tracer uptake, and scanners have to estimate this attenuation, usually with the help of CT scan. So the role in urology or ecology, we'll go through the various cancers. Firstly, prostate cancer. We all know that there's a high PSA recurrence rate, up to 40% in 10 years after primary treatment, whether it be radiotherapy or uh, radical prostatectomy. Some of the current clinical problems in prostate cancer include the original localization of the tumor within the prostate, accurate detection of metastatic disease, and current staging and localizing, localization techniques are poor until the PSA is relatively high. An example of this is that there's a less than 5% chance of finding a positive bone scan until the PSA is greater than 40 nanograms per mil. Whole body bone scan and abdominal CTs add little diagnostic value until the PSA is relatively high, such as over 20 nanograms per mil. Detection of tumours in patients with a rising PSA and negative biopsy is another area of concern, and determining a therapeutic response to treatment is an issue. Some of the radio traces, there's been multiple radio traces that have been used in prostate cancer, and the classic one of FDG is limited because glucose utilisation in well-differentiated prostate cancer is lower than in other tissues, and therefore the FDG uptake is poor. Also, the urinary excretion once again comes into play which can mask prostate cancers. There's also an overlap between prostate cancer, BPH and inflammation making it difficult to diagnose. Acetate um, uptake in tumour cells is proportional to lipid synthesis and it's been mapped. It is metabolised and incorporated into the cellular lipid pool. It's mostly excreted by the pancreas and intestines with little urinary excretion. More commonly these days, choline, um, which is a vitamin, is, is a necessary compound involved in cellular membrane ph phospholipid synthesis, transmembrane signaling, and lipid and cholesterol metabolism and transport. It has minimal excretion, uh, urinary, urinary excretion. Proliferation and upregulated membrane lipid synthesis are some characteristic, feature, characteristic features found in cancer cells. And we know that there are high choline levels in prostate cancer cells thought to be due to increased fatty acid synthesis when compared to normal prostate cells. Currently the Mayo Clinic is the only clinic uh, in North America where it is approved, but this is likely to change in the near future. So diagnosis and staging. FDG PET has been shown to have really a variable and low sensitivity as uh, demonstrated by three trials with such a wide range of sensitivity. It's unable to detect small foci because of the spatial resolution and it really has no 
current definite, definitive role for assessment of local advanced or staging for noble disease. Acetate has a relative increase uh, found in prostate cancer compared to BPH in normal tissue, uh, but it appears to be inferior to multi-parametric MRI with a sensitivity and specificity as listed there. With regards to choline, it has the studies have shown a sort of variable sensitivity and specificity, and uh, it can be masked, masked by prostatitis, BPH in normal tissue, and once again we have the issue of low spatial resolution. One of the earlier studies previously by Tester in 2007 compared choline PET CT uh, with MRI and 3D MRIS. And the relative uh, sensitivities and specificities are listed there, but really choline PET CT had a lower sensitive sensitivity than 3D MRI alone, all combined with 3D uh, all combined with MRI in detecting prostate cancer. And the overall accuracy of choline PET in defining local tumor stage is approximately said to be 70%. It tends to understage prostate cancer and currently has a limited role in treatment decisions in patients with localised prostate cancer. Fluorocholine is another tracer that's been used um, with variable sensitivity and specificity and is thought to have some potential use when the PSA is very high, poorly differentiated tumours or probably locally advanced disease. <coughs> I've got an image of here that you may see that just a 63-year-old patient with a PSA of 12.6. Um, this is for local staging. The left image is obviously a T2-weighted MRI image and the right a uh, fusion CT PET FTG. Clearly, uh, it's not so... Well, clearly on the left-hand side, you could probably even see it there. There is extension of tumour um, through the peripheral zone, the transition zone on the left-hand side of the MRI, which gives good anatomical information. This is a gross example in the PET CT, <coughs> although it is relatively obvious, it's still anatomical information is quite difficult to obtain. And you could imagine if there was uptake in the bladder, this might even be more difficult. These are all the studies that have been used by various tracers uh, in the last sort of 10 years, and the numbers tend to be pretty small, and the sensitivities and specificities relatively variable. FDG, as we said, not really very helpful. Uh, acetate, variable sensitivity and specificities, and similar to choline and fluorocholine. <coughs> With regards to lymph nodes, extended uh, pelvic lymph node dissection is time consuming, adds uh, morbi potential morbidity and cost. Choline sensitivity is ranging from 60 to 78 percent with, with a specificity of 82 to 92 percent. And obviously the bigger the lymph nodes, the better detection rate. And when they're over one centimetre, it's up to 77 to 90 percent are detected, it's said. Fluorocholine has a, a very wide ranging sensitivity and specificity as well, it's slightly better. There is high sensitivity when there is high tumour viability, such as a high histological grade, high clinical stage, or a tumour <coughs> in a patient with a high PSA. So, in summary, CT PET shows better performance in conventional imaging for local regional lymph nodes, but not as good as a form of lymphadenectomy. This is an image of a 60-year-old male with a lymph node metastasis and a PSA of 2.9 after a radical prostatectomy. The CT image gives us information about um, the possible mass in the um, pelvic lymph nodes, and as you can see, this, the combined CT PET really does show a metast metastatic deposit if we compare FDG, PET and choline, the row on the top is FDG, FDG, PET, and the low on the bottom is choline. Some of the issues come to play where we've got uh, urinary excretion in the upper row in the FDG, um, and uh, whereas in the choline we have uptake in the pelvic lymph nodes as well as the left seminal vesicle. Some of the PET avid uh, uptake is also seen uh, in the uh, in the bowel, kidney and the liver, which is expected. Moving on to bone metastasis, currently we use 99 methylene diphosphate uh, bone scan, which may miss early metastasis as it relies on osteoblastic turnover of cells. Um, 
I think inflammation and granulomatous disease here. Yeah. Bone metastasis, so um, so we use osteoblastic turnover, and these can be relatively non-specific with regards to uh, trauma and osteoarthritis. <coughs> PET allows us the ability to distinguish between metabolically active lesions and non-viable bony lesions, and that may uh, choline PET may have a superior early detection for bone marrow metastatic disease, but is relatively expensive and uh, has that higher radiation dose. These some images. Firstly, uh, going from left to right, we have the PET scan, CT scan, and the fused images. This is FDG PET. You can see obviously multiple, obviously multiple um, PET avid lesions in the sternum and uh, spine. And when we fuse these together, we get some good anatomical information um, and confirmation. Choline PET CT um, can be better than bone scintigraphy with a sensitivity of 88, 89 percent, specificity of 98 to 100 percent. And Fusio showed metastasis in 18 of 123 patients, or approximately 15%, who previously had negative results on bone scans. So therefore, in equivocal cases, bone metastasis can be imaged with choline or fluoride PET-CT as an option. One of the more interesting areas is PSA recurrence. And we know that PSA is a very sensitive tool for looking at recurrence in primary, after primary treatment, but it cannot distinguish between local, regional, or distal distant metastasis. And what is the PSA cutoff when a choline PET CT becomes suitable? This really hasn't been defined yet. A choline PET for restaging post-treatment has a pretty variable sensitivity and specificity as listed. And it depends on how high the PSA <coughs> is. The higher the PSA, the more likely the scan is to be positive. Husserick uh, confirmed that PET CT is more accurate when PSA is greater than two nanograms per mil. And an example of when your PSA is over 2 nanograms per mil and with previous negative images, uh, imaging studies such as a uh, CT and bone scan, a choline PET will be positive and only, only about 28%, which is still better. A PSA doubling time of less than three months is also a strong predictor of PET positivity. Choline PET is also more likely to be positive in advanced pathological stays, previous biochemical failure and advanced age. The higher the PSA, the faster the doubling time, the better the predictability of choline PET. Evangelista from Italy uh, did a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at choline, uh, uh, 18 fluorine choline and also 11 carbon choline PET or PET-CT. There were 19 articles eventually found with a total of 1,555 patients. And they pulled all the data together and for all sites of disease, the sensitivity was 86%, specificity 93%. Prostatic fossil recurrence was quite a bit lower, and lymph node metastasis was quite quite sensitive but not as specific. And choline PET and PET CT represent high sensitivity and specificity for the detection of local, regional, and distant metastasis. They have similar detection in regards to tumour, but the longer half life of 18 fluorine perhaps perhaps makes it more practical. And these are some of the studies which have been done looking at the uh, biochemical recurrence after primary treatment. Relatively small numbers. Giro Vaccini has um, got numbers up to uh, 358 with a PSA mean of 1.27 with a sensitivity of 85, specificity of 93%. So the numbers are really getting, getting there. MRI, PET, PET MRI, which is not that common in the literature, has the advantage of improved soft tissue contrast, truly simultaneous imaging, an added benefit of diffusion perfusion imaging and images and functional studies. There are a number of small studies looking at this, which so far it seems to have similar results with regards to PET and um, with regards to MRI and CT. There's also a high cost involved and I would say currently limited evidence. So having said all that, in summary, prostate cancer would say PET CT has a limited role in the diagnosis of prostate cancer. It's not preferred for detection <coughs> and local staging of untreated prostate cancer or for residual or local recurrence because of the limited spatial resolution. Choline PET really has, is coming to the forefront uh, 
um, and playing a role in biochemical occurrence following, following primary treatment. It depends on the PSA value, the PSA doubling time, the PSA velocity. And obviously the higher the PSA, the faster the doubling time, the better the predictive value. I think it's true to say if the PSA is less than one nanogram per mil, then choline PET really is not useful. It may play a role in a selected patient population with a higher PSA level, with higher PSA levels and poorly differentiated cancer to exclude distant metastasis when salvage treatment is intended. Moving on to renal cancer, this is a relatively short topic renal cancer, but FDGP is not very useful because of the radio tracer in the urine as described. <coughs> we can give diuretics to help in the imaging. And acetate, um, in the lead and carbon acetate has been tried, and there are conflicting studies whether this is increased or decreased in the primary renus or carcinoma. There are various novel radio traces that have been used, and this is an interesting area of research to look to try and identify the actual type of renus or carcinoma, but I don't think we're there for a standard role at this point in time. With regards to staging, Martinez in 2007 had a small meta-analysis, uh, oh, uh, sorry, not a yeah, small meta-analysis looking at FDG PET and renus or carcinoma carcinoma concluded that it was useful in the diagnosis of staging with a sensitivity of 0.87 and specificity of 0.93. More recently, Wang uh, looked at the meta-analysis in 14 studies, found that renal cell carcinoma diagnosis in primary treatment using F FDG PET was really not very useful, but in staging the numbers were really quite good, and concluded that it's helpful in detecting extra renal metastasis but not primary renal lesions. An example of FDG PET in renal cell carcinoma. This patient had a renal cell carcinoma on the right removed one year ago, and there's <coughs> possibility and concern about the right renal bed. The first images are PET scan, second CT, and the fused image in third, and it really does give good, good resolution of the anatomic and metabolic activity of the metastasis, which, which can be seen in the right renal bed here. There is some uptake in the bowel as expected, and also the left wing uh, collecting system as expected. So in summary, FDG PET has a limited role in detecting primary renal, renal lesions. It has suitable sensitivity and specificity for metastasis. Um, there's currently no role in uh, preoperative local staging in the true role of PET in diagnosis and follow-up of renal cell carcinoma no remains to be determined. And there's not currently a standard investigation, but I think really we'll have an interesting future. Bladder cancer, CT and MRI are currently used for preoperative staging. These are relatively limited because of, because of a high false negative rate. There's currently a role for more accurate preoperative staging and uh, FDG PET is limited because of the urinary excretion. Intravenous fluids and diuretics have been used and novel techniques such as Foley catheter insertion, later flushing and subsequent filling with normal saline have been used to improve the dissection of primary bladder cancer in PET CT. Glaskins uh, reviewed the role of FTG PET in detecting lymph node and distant metastasis in 55 patients preoperatively and found a relatively low sensitivity of 60%. Lou had a slightly higher one of 77%, but this uh, decreased to 50% after chemotherapy, as you'd expect. Specificity was moderately high at 88%. There have been other radio traces that are listed with really little success. More recently, last year, Lou uh, did a meta-analysis on a, really a small number of studies um, and found that the pool PET-CT data for primary lesion detection was quite high, but these was, this was really in two, two, two papers only. They, uh, they also investigated FTG PET and PET-CT versus CT alone for staging and restaging of metastatic lesions in the bladder and found that PET-CT is more accurate than CT alone. You concluded that FTG PET was helpful in the diagnosis of metastatic lesions in the urinary bladder cancer, but the studies were limited and its use in bladder war tumors was not established. Mertens from uh, Amsterdam and their group have published quite extensively on um, this area, and one of the interesting articles I saw was regarding neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which you could say is really the standard now for muscle invasive urethral carcinoma in many parts of the world. However, one of the issues is the number of non-responders that comes up. And their group reviewed the PET-CT role in monitoring the uh, response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy with regards to the lymph nodes and bladder cancer. There were small numbers, 19 patients. 
an FDG PET and contrast enhanced CT were done before and after a meeting of four cycles in the age of chemotherapy, which was either MVAP or GEMSYS. 13 had preoperative uh, biopsies and all underwent a pelvic lymph node dissection. Histology determines a responder from a non responder. FDG PET CT and contrast enhanced CT distinguished responders from non responders in 18 and 15 out of 19, respectively, which was really quite good. And FDG PET was better than CT alone. So the assessment of nodal response with FDG PET CT would be a very interesting area and may be considered in the future as a surrogate for survival or prognosis. It may reflect uh, efficacy of a certain chemotherapy regimen and this may allow alter alternative chemotherapy um, treatment um, if it's not responding or early surgical intervention. It also may uh, allow you to avoid futile surgery in patients with rapidly progressive disease. The same group looked at, tried to look at the impact that PET-CT have, would have on clinical decisions. This is a retrospective study of 96 patients. It's important to note that standard uh, treatment wasn't near edge of the for T2 disease here. Patients underwent a contrast enhanced CT of the chest, abdomen and pelvis less than four weeks before an FTG PET-CT. And the preferred treatment strategies before and after the PET-CT were determined for each patient. Treatment options include local curative intent, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and palliative treatment. They estimated 22% um, that the stage was different on FDG PET compared to the contrast enhanced CT, and upstaging occurred in 20% of cases. There was some, a small number of downstaging with the PET CT. So they estimated that clinical management change in 13 of these patients subsequent to the PET CT, uh, mostly in upstaging, six were changed to neoadjuvant, and seven were changed to palliative. Treatment. It's important also to know that eight patients in the 96 had incidental uh, additional primary tumours that were found from the PET. So, in summary, bladder cancer, there's no real role at the moment for nodal staging of muscle invasive bladder cancer due to the lack of data. Detection of distant metastasis is being established, and PET CT, I think, is looking very promising in the future. Monitoring a response to therapy is um, still uh, currently research, it's not established. That would be a very interesting area for the future, given what PET does for other malignancies. I think everyone knows that testicular cancer and FGG PET have become really a standard of management, and we really expect a major role for PET in this area because of the high cell turnover rates in germ cell tumours. Some of the diagnostic learners that are still not solved by conventional imaging techniques include the current staging of patients classified as stage 1, evaluation of residual masses after chemotherapy, which is a big issue, and the study of rising markers without clinical evidence of disease. We know that 33% or thereabouts of clinical stage 1 non-seminomas germ cell tumour have retroperitoneal nodes, and 18% of clinical stage 1 seminomas are relapsing of retroperitoneum during surveillance, and more accurate staging would allow us to confidently um, advise surveillance and also avoid potential side effects of treatment in the 80% percent the uh, truly T1 N0. FDG PET is really the mainstay of radio tracing that's been used in this area. Some of the limitations include inflammatory or granulomalous tissues um, which show FDG avid uptake. Lesions less than one centimetre are often not detected. And most importantly, mature teratoma is indistinguishable from normal or necrotic tissue. With regards to non seminomous germ cell tumour, FDG PET is controversial in the role of staging, and uh, Haddad looked at a prospective trial reviewed and reviewed the role of FDG PET CT. In 111 high risk patients, they had an FDG PET within eight weeks after orthopedectomy or normal, or well, marker normalisation. Of the 88 PET negative and therefore thought to be relatively low risk of recurrence, 33 relapsed, and the trial, <coughs> the trial finished early. So, no, no certain role in uh, non seminomous germ cell tumour. With regards to seminoma, several studies have indicated that FDG is a standard in the evaluation of residual seminoma after chemotherapy. It's obviously important to stage accurately, given how technically demanding the post-chemotherapy surgery can be, to can be secondary to fibrosis and desmoplastic reactions. DeSantis um, and later on the following year, Betchero in the same department uh, looked at 53 patients with metastatic pure seminoma. The size of the residual lesions on CT, whether they're greater than 3 centimetres, less than 3 centimetres, were correlated with the presence or absence of viable residual tumour. 
all underwent an FDD PET of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis um, four to twelve weeks after chemotherapy. There was no more. It was no more than a two-week interval between the PET and the CT. PET scans were compared to the histology or follow-up scans, which could be progressing or stable, to confirm the original PET decision. All 19 lesions greater than 3 cm, that is 100%, and 35 of the 37 less than or equal to 3 were correctly predicted by PET FDG. And it was found to be much better in the post chemotherapy setting with a sensitivity of 80, specificity of 100%, positive predictive value of 100%, and negative predictive value of 96% compared to CT, which was quite a bit lower. And therefore, in patients with the residual lesions greater than 3 cm after chemotherapy, if PET is negative, surgery can be omitted safely. And if PET is positive, residual lesions must be regarded as harboring viable tumour and surgery should be performed. So the current role of uh, in testicular um, PET testicular tumours, uh, there's not enough evidence to support the use in the routine staging. It is recommended for the follow-up of patients with seminoma and any residual mass, and if it's greater than three centimetres, uh, it should be performed. If it's less than three centimetres, it's potentially optional must be performed greater than four weeks after chemotherapy and this limits the false negative due to chemotherapy induced suppression of, of metabolic activity as you'd expect and also reduces the false positive secondary inflammation. So this is a quick summary of all the cancers. So PET-CT in prostate cancer, limited role in diagnosis, local staging of untreated cancer and residual local recurrence. Holding PET-CT is a really interesting role and will soon be coming, I think, to uh, this country with regarding biochemical recurrence following primary treatment, depending on the PSA level, doubling time and velocity. Choline PET is not useful really at this stage, I think, in patients with a PSA of less than one nanogram per mil. Renal cancer, no current role for local staging, and the true role is still yet to be delineated, but it remains um, remains an interesting area which uh, can be used in a selected patient population. Bladder cancer, no role in nodal staging, muscle invasive disease at this stage due to insufficient data. Detection of distant metastasis being established and looks promising. And monitoring a response to therapy is a potential future um, avenue. And as said in testicular cancer, seminoma greater than three centimeters with a residual mass after chemotherapy, very important. And important to wait that four weeks Finally, I'd just like to have a couple of slides looking at the research um, in CRPC and nuclear medicine. Um, this isn't PET scan, but it's an interesting area that's coming to Canada soon. And as uh, a, a recent uh, paper produced by Parker in the New England Journal of Medicine in July came out, which I found quite, um, quite interesting. It's a phase three randomized double blinded trial looking at the uh, efficacy and safety of gradient 223 versus the placebo in CRPC patients with brain metastasis. So what is radium-223? Well, it's a, it's a dichloride target of <coughs> alpha emitter. It selectively binds to areas of increased bone turnover in bone metastasis and emits high energy alpha particles over a very short range. As a bone-seeking calcium emetic, it's bound into newly formed bone stroma, especially in the microenvironment of osteoblastic or sclerotic metastasis. And the high energy alpha particle radiation induces mainly double, induces mainly double stranded DNA breaks that result in the potent and highly localised cytotoxic effect in targeted areas. The short path of the alpha particle means that, that, that the toxic effects on adjacent healthy tissue, and particularly the bone marrow, are minimised. It's been reported to have a favourable safety pro profile with minimal myelotoxicity in the phase one and two studies in patients with CRPC and bone metastasis. Phase two uh, studies have shown that radium-223 reduces pain, improves disease-related biomarkers such as bone alkaline phosphatase and PSA, and there is a suggested survival benefit um, in these patients in phase two studies. So this study looked at the survival benefit of radium-223 in CRPC with bone metastases. Previous use or non-use of docetaxel patients were involved. Baseline alkaline phosphatase was also done, and current use or non-use of phosphate boost phosphonate recorded. And the median overall survival is 14.9 months versus 11.3 in the placebo group. And as compared to the placebo, uh, there's a 30% reduction in risk of death with a hazard ratio of 0.7. And this was consistent uh, uh, 
this consistently proved survival across all groups and the trial terminated early because of the overall survival improvement. We await further studies looking at combination of sequential therapy in this. But it's an interesting area that uh, uh, is coming to Canada soon. So that's it. Thanks to the BC Cancer Agency Nuclear Medicine Department and uh, particularly Dan Worsley and Francois.